And bang, just like that, we're live. Uh, welcome everyone to Live at Epifan. It is Thursday at 3 o'clock Eastern. And Dan and I are here to talk about, honestly, some pretty interesting news. We've got a mixed bag of stuff, but I think it'll be a fun show regardless. So, Dan, how, how are you? I'm doing well, George. How are you today? Not bad. You know, it's not exactly the nicest day outside, but, uh, you know, you make do these days. I'm glad we got some rain. We needed it. So That's true. That's, That's true. Yeah. Driest May in 100 years. So, yes, a little bit of rain does some good. Um, so... Of course, as usual, everyone, uh, feel free to say hi in chat. I see a couple people saying hi in chat. Um, you know, Linda is saying hi uh, from Ottawa. So she's doing some barbecue right now. It must be nice in the middle of the day. Um, got someone from Uganda uh, saying hello in chat, which is awesome. Welcome. Thanks, everyone. If you have any questions as we go through the show, throw them into chat or just say hi or shout out whatever you feel like it. Uh, we're here every Thursday, every other Thursday <laughs> uh, doing one of these shows. Um, but Dan, what do we have on tap for today? Yeah, well, we got our first segment, the lowdown. We're gonna the run rundown, through the lowdown. <laughs> some news. Um, so this was a big down. story uh, mm -hmm. just last week. Amazon, the company that never stops growing, uh, to acquire <laughs> film giant MGM for eight point four five bu -bu -bu billion dollars. Billion with a B. Yeah, yeah that's a big uh, one. I saw an interesting take as part of this, which was Amazon now owns America being basically this is, you know, a lot of those online streaming services like Netflix and Amazon. They've constantly been trying to crack that Hollywood bubble by doing their own productions. But this is this is like now nah, we just went out and just bought Hollywood, <laughs> basically. Um, and that's uh, this is a significant take. I mean, a lot of people are saying it's not that much money for what for buying an entire studio arguably mgm has been bankrupt for a long time so that's not surprising yeah but, but the library george the library yeah I mean, the photo is here significant. that's every james bond movie there you go that's yeah this is significant intellectual property that's worth definitely more than eight billion dollars um so I don't know. We'll see. I, I'm curious to see where it goes, right? It, does this mean I'm going to get the MGM channel on Amazon Prime for free now without having to pay the extra four bucks a month? Or are they still going to bleed me dry by making it an upgrade? Uh, I also I wonder <laughs> whether Amazon is committed to theater releases of films. Um, well, so. that's the interesting thing. Are they going to go, you know, full studio? Or is, is this just going to be a subsidiary running on its own? It, you know, back in say. the day, every studio had its own theater chain, right? Mm -hmm. So it was completely vertically in integrated industry. And, you know, yeah. we haven't been used to that since about the 50s. <laughs> but uh, maybe it's coming back. Who knows? Um, yeah, it's it's interesting. We'll have to see. Um, it's, it's, it's a curious thing. But, um, you know, now it means Amazon has a major Hollywood studio. They obviously have one of the top streaming platforms with Prime. Um, they deliver all of your goods. They uh, also have a grocery shopping. Uh, yeah grocery shopping um they you know their owner owns some of the top news organizations in the world so you know yeah they got they got everything now it's a one-stop shop speaking of uh one-stop shop uh the internet in canada <laughs> <laughs> or um, what's so, left of it <laughs> so a couple of things happening here there's kind of two items we're tracking um one of them is a proposed bill in canada called bill c10 that would give the Canadian broadcast regulator the power to dictate some new rules to many of the major social platforms, video platforms, you name it. So maybe yeah. you could tell us a little bit about what's going on here, George. I'll try and do it without getting too uh, heated um, because this is a touchy subject, uh, I think, for myself and a lot of people because it's, it's this concept that turning the internet and some of the things we use on the internet and treat them as traditional television broadcasters. And to me, that is insane. Um, because that that's, to me, that's anti-competitive, first of all, um, especially within the Canadian landscape, where both media and internet is dominated by three companies and only three companies. Um, and you're giving the control over to an organization that is also largely dominated by those three companies, um, which, you know, that to me sounds a bit crazy. Uh, you know, if if 
as Amazon is doing, if you just literally sold all of Hollywood to Amazon and every news organization to Amazon, would you really expect them to be fair and competitive? Of course not. You know, if they own everything, they control everything. They don't have to be. So this is a, it's a, it's a silly thing. They claim it's all about Canadian content and, and discoverability. Um, but if you're talking about discoverability on something like YouTube or Netflix, even if you want Canadian content, you just search for Canadian, Canadian content. And there it is, <laughs> right? Like and, and if you want it, you, you know, search it. Canadian content actually performs extremely well globally. Um, it's one of the most mm -hmm. successful YouTube creator countries in the world. Um, right. In fact, 90, I just saw Google released some information yesterday saying 90% of the Canadian content that's created is consumed outside of Canada. Um, right. So the walled garden approach, I don't think it necessarily is wise. And uh, yeah, we're, no. we're living in the 21st century. Um, the I, internet I, is supposed to be a free and open platform, right? Like that's the idea is arguably the ultimate form of capitalism, totally free, open market for people to consume because that's what they want. Um, these types of rules, you know, what's what's really the difference between that and the great Chinese firewall, right? Like, let's let's be serious. Yeah. Um, there's not a lot of difference. At the same time, CRTC, uh, I'll just if we bring up the uh, the screen share again there, Cameron, um, uh, recent decision to revert, well, reversing a decision to um, lower the wholesale rates of their networks, the big three providers, uh, has been reversed. So this, what right. does this mean for consumers, George? Well, this is a prime example of why giving the CRTC, the, the regulatory body, giving them power over content is a bad idea. They can't even use the power they have properly without being anti-competitive. Um, so it's, <laughs> this is just a prime example. Basically, you know, because three companies dominate all of the physical infrastructure for internet delivery in Canada, um, they have to resell time on that physical infrastructure to third-party resellers, right? So smaller ISPs that, that resell the service. Um, those smaller ISPs said, we can't compete because it's just, it, the wholesale rates are so ridiculously high that we just can't compete, but we also don't have a choice. So last year, the CRTC came out and, and had rules saying, okay, we need to lower this. And that was kind of a mandate from the government because Canada has some of the most expensive internet in the world. Um, and so it was to try to reduce it. You know, obviously everyone in the pandemic needed internet to, and everyone needs it to be cheaper. But now they've reversed that because of lobbying from the big three companies that dominate the market. Um, and what happened? They said, oh, don't worry, it won't actually impact prices to the consumer until two hours later when everyone jacked their rates. Um, it, so it, it was complete nonsense, the idea that it wouldn't impact pricing because it, it did within hours. Um, and, and it only means that those big three companies can continue to dominate their price fixing scheme on internet access in the country and that's um well once again should it be comes, illegal it come once again it, i think it comes back to um what we've been talking about a lot is the you know new options like starlink or you know disruptive yeah. internet options need competitors people. um yeah let's hope it happens. well and it's funny uh, there's 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 a, an existing satellite internet provider in Canada that service is honestly generally generally terrible. Um, and their reaction <laughs> to Starlink entering the market was to increase prices, not lower them to be competitive, but to increase them while not improving the service really at all. Um, so it's, it, it's crazy. Uh, this, and I guess this is very Canadian centric content and I apologize for our friends watching from Uganda and other, place, other places, but this is a cautious tale that even in a country like Canada, you need to stay engaged at a political level to watch out for this type of behavior and to make sure it doesn't happen. Because what's the next step? I mentioned Great Firewall of China. Some people may be aware of what happened uh, in, in Belarus with them 
forcing an aircraft to land to arrest a journalist, right? Because they didn't like what he's saying. When you start giving governments these kind of controls, things get out of hand very quickly. Um, it needs to be fair and open. That's the point of the internet. That's a nice summary. Why don't we? Why don't we just leave it at that, George? We could go yeah. forever on this. Topic. We could. Dan and I could read for hours about this, as we do on social media. But uh, yeah. yeah, we'll 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 have to leave it for another time to follow up on this. Um, yeah. But speaking of satellite internet, here's something that uses satellite internet: a a boat that drives itself. Drives itself. Sales itself. <laughs> Sales itself, yeah. Uh, yeah. This is uh, Videosoft created a, a new low bandwidth uh, video streaming technology to take advantage of satellite mm. internet so that they can use artificial intelligence um, with a series of, I think, six cameras on this Mayflower ship that use some artificial intelligence to pilot the ship. Um, so this ship will be making a voyage across the Atlantic without any crew on board from Plymouth, United Kingdom to Plymouth, Massachusetts. Um, so I just thought this was, you know, we talk about video AI quite a bit, and uh, this is pretty darn cool. It's very interesting. Um, we already made our own internal jokes in the pre-show about, you know, but there's some weird choices here. Choosing the name Mayflower is a... I understand why they did that, but maybe not the best choice. Um, going from Plymouth to Plymouth, I, I can get it, but maybe not the best choice. Um, but the technology is cool. Um, I just think they probably should have chose some different branding yeah. <laughs> um, I and mean, destinations. To but me, this maybe it's seems like a more natural uh, type of autonomous vehicle than a car. Well, For sure. Know, the amount of compute required to keep a car in a lane and not kill anyone is tremendous. Yeah. Whereas something like a right. ship, like, you know, you would think that that's uh, probably a lot of practical applications for this without necessarily needing, you know, like the, the leaps not crashing in the Suez Canal. <laughs> <laughs> right. But if we could get, uh, a, if we could get ships moving on their own, that's, that'd be pretty big. Yeah, I mean, the reality is, is that moving goods across the earth, right, is it is still the cheapest to do by uh, by sea. And it is still the backbone of the global economy to move things by sea. Um, and doing it autonomously could increase that flow, uh, could reduce the risk, um, you know. Uh, so there's, there's some interesting potential there. And I agree, it's not like driving on the highway, on a six-lane highway with... Uh, thousands of other people in a car it's it there's the open ocean there are established shipping lanes but they're nowhere near as crowded as <laughs> as, as the roads so yeah i agree it's a it's more of a natural fit for sure um speaking of demanding video encoding um youtube is now building its own transcoding chips this is this is mm -hmm. very interesting a cdn making hardware um have you heard of this george well, I mean, to be fair, it's technically Google, and they're not exactly foreign to making hardware. Um, you know, they, they also have plans to start making their own mobile processors for future Google Pixel phones, right? So that's, that's not that crazy, I don't think. Although it is an interesting choice. Um, and I'm, I'm really curious to see what the consumer results of this are, right? I mean... Cameron, our producer, mentioned this the other day that processing times on YouTube have been going way up just because the usage is so high, right? They just can't keep up. And that's certainly driving part of this creation is is trying to get those processing uh, times down. Mm -hmm. Less time means more content out, more content means more customer. And if you're Google, more customer means more ads and more revenue. Obviously, it's a business. Um, so, yeah, I'm just curious how big of an impact this makes because... I remember reading they're primarily focused on these hardware devices, uh, really focused around the the VP codecs, which which Google has cha you know championed for a long time that really no one else uses. So it's kind of curious to see where they go with this, um, and if that even makes sense. And again, is that going to make processing times better? Is that going to make the transcode times better for up down scaling and things like that? Is is, is it going to actually improve the service um, well, it, i'm curious to see maybe it just mitigates the uh eventual you know 
limits of what is possible. I mean, there's 500 hours of content uploaded to YouTube every minute. Exactly. Um, and it's, growing. It's crazy. Uh, so, you know, at what point do you say, hey, any videos from 10 years plus need to be archived? <laughs> or, you know, how do you keep up with that? I just, I question how long that that exponential growth can take place. It's going to require masses of massive amounts of investment in the technology. And I guess that's what we're seeing here. Yeah. Well, it's again, it's also curious because the general trends these days have been move, moving to cloud-based compute. And this is almost a reversal where, you know, you're going to stick these hardware cards somewhere in a rack, somewhere in a data center, right? And that's kind of, yes, the cloud is powered by those data centers somewhere, <laughs> uh, but it's usually a little more distributed and, and virtualized where this is, this is a, a different approach. Um, so that's why I'm curious to see what the actual impact is. If it's good, then awesome. And then the applications of this hardware could be used in, in other devices, um, theoretically, right? So could be good. Um, wanted to kick over to some sort of uh, retrospective on a <laughs> prediction we made a couple years ago. Well, I guess like a, a couple years ago now. Um, this is yeah. from our prediction show for 2020 and we predicted that a deep fake will cause an international incident um yeah and we just saw this and thought it was interesting but uh there was some kind of uh politicians on uh, a foreign affairs committee who had a guest join their call who was a deep fake guest someone impersonating someone else so we're starting to see this happening now in real life um, so we were a year off, but we were kind of right. <laughs> we're just always too early, George. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah. We're just way ahead of the curve. That's we're, the problem. We're, yeah. we're predicting yeah. two years ahead. Um, yeah. <laughs> but at any rate, I, I think here's the photo of the side by side. So on the right, actually, the the call. And it's very convincing, actually. Um, yeah. When, when you see and this and you know, what's what's funny is that facial hair is one of the hardest things to deep fake. Right. And so this bearded guy man that's <laughs> yeah, absolutely that's... and that it's being done like live on a zoom call you know in real time um and yeah enough so that it's actually convincing people who know this person that, that it's him them. yeah um which is you know uh, here's the quote i thought that was interesting here um it's clear the so-called truth decay or post-truth and post-fact era has the potential to seriously threaten the safety and stability of local and international countries governments and societies um yeah, that's a little unsettling. This is a Black Mirror. Episode. Yeah, and, and yeah, exactly. And you know, what do you, what do you do about it? I think is one of the the interesting questions, right? Is is it something now where, you know, well, it's funny because we were chatting about cryptocurrencies before we went live just for fun, but like this is actually a place where maybe blockchain type technology would actually be useful imagine blockchain integrated into something like zoom everyone has their own token and that token gets verified when you join you know that would give you a pass to avoid this stuff right you know politician x is supposed to identify with with chain code y and if they don't get them out <laughs> yeah, i think you're um, onto something there george you know that's total sidebar verify get that little something. check mark this is the real guy that's the advantage of blockchain, not currencies, but that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it it's a bit scary, but I don't think we're going to see it still necessarily widespread because um, I think in some cases it's a it's a bit it's a bit better. But I do find it interesting that you know when we put that in the predictions two years ago, I was like, come on, really? Are we really serious about this? But we were. Yeah, we yeah, were. There we go. Um, so speaking of politicians and live streaming. Um, Oh, this is grind my wishes. gears. Maybe we should maybe we should run yeah. the, uh, the yeah the we'll title run this. Card. Uh, grind my gear. Do we have it, Cameron? Do we have it? In our segment. There it is. Oh, there we go. Grind George's gears. favorite segment. Grind the gears. Uh, it is yes, my favorite. More segment. More live streaming news. <laughs> um, yeah. Canadian. Someone who wishes it was deep faked. <laughs> yeah. Canadian member of parliament caught on camera urinating, and this was only a couple weeks after he was fully naked on camera <laughs> in a Zoom call. Uh, Two-time loser. Here, George? Yeah. <laughs> I listen. I don't want to pick on Will Amos that much. Um, you know, he's, he's actually a semi-local MP to where we live. I know people who live in his riding. 
and don't dislike him entirely as a person. But um, the main thing we wanted to raise here is not to pick on Mr. Amos, but really to point out that, guys, we're almost a year and a half into all this remote work stuff. It's really not that hard. <laughs> like, these are the mistakes you should have made in the first, you know, six weeks, maybe six months. But come on, like... And let alone, and this just kind of goes twice. into well, exactly twice in a, in a couple of weeks, right? It's just just nuts. And to me, it's it's why it grinds my gears um, is that, in, and we've talked about this on this show in our webinar content and a bunch of other things. It is not that expensive and is not that difficult to learn how to do Zoom and remote production inexpensively and have it look good. And some of the places where it drives me nuts that they can't seem to get it right is in politics and in mainstream media, right? These are two areas where funding should not be an issue to have someone go buy a few hundred bucks worth of stuff. Yeah. Like it's this, pocket change. I think this also makes a good case for tally lights, honestly. That too. Um, which is actually yeah. a feature that we have on Pearl. Um, and so does Zoom. You can go buy a busy light and plug it into your PC and it'll give you a giant red light when you're in a meeting in Zoom. Yeah. It's absolutely. not hard. <laughs> yeah. I think it's something um, that needs to happen. We have it on Pearls. Um, it's, it's not difficult to do. But but even then, it goes. Be, to me, this goes deeper, right? It goes into the fact that you still see people joining with their crappy AirPods that sound like garbage and cut out halfway through and the batteries die. No, just get better gear. Um walking around naked no just don't point your camera at your bathroom like what are you doing uh none of this is hard it's really not hard um and it doesn't have to be expensive you don't have to be a professional to do it y y you know you just have to think about it for two seconds and at this late stage of the pandemic there's no excuse there really isn't um you know we've been doing this show and our webinars and yeah we haven't a been lot of our recorded content and yeah, I've been year. naked once on camera. And, uh, you know, I, I even the gaffes we have made are very minor. Um, and we've been doing content that looks and sounds good from day one. Um, so, you know, uh, I'm just kind of sick of the excuses, sick of seeing it, because a lot of this stuff's not going away, right? Like people have learned, the people who've learned how to do this properly are going to keep doing it because it works and really reap, and well reap, and reap the rewards uh you can see the, right. the spectrum of you know basically public shaming versus all the way from public yeah. shaving shaming to like massively reaching well, new audiences and you know i read a poll yesterday that that said something like 40 percent of employees are considering quitting their jobs if that job asks them to go back to the office. They want to stay working from home and they're willing to leave their position and leave the company if they're being asked to change and go back to the office. 40%. Wow. That, like this technology, what people have been doing for the past year, people have adapted. I, for one, actually want to go back to the office, but there are many people who don't. And I don't think it's too much of an ask to say, hey, guys, that's cool. But if you're going to do it, and I actually think politicians working remotely is more democratic. So I'd like that. But there's no excuse to not do it properly. <laughs> like, come on. <laughs> um, let's kick it over now to our one of our favorite segments, the kitchen. Let's let's head over to the kitchen, and get a coffee. Yeah. Uh, maybe some coffee. ramen I actually noodles. Think I emptied my coffee. I did empty my coffee. I have water, though. I got water, too. Nice, nice cold Yeti. Yeah, get some water. Uh, so before we get into the kitchen too much here, uh, we do have a question from Sonoga. Um, he's mm -hmm. asking about, you know, the comparison between Pearl Nano and um, Pearl, Pearl Mini. Mini. So, you know, yeah. if you have a Nano, why would you consider a Mini? Well, they have different feature sets, first of all. Um, Pearl Nano is awesome, but it is a very entry-level device. When you move into Pearl Mini, not only do you get more inputs, you get the larger touchscreen, you get some more advanced audio input options, 
but maybe most importantly, you get multiple encoded outputs, multiple output channels, and mixing and switching. So those multiple encoding channels and the mixing and switching is something that Nano does not have and will not have. So you're if you're someone who doesn't need those things, you're you don't need a third a, yeah, input. You're all set with a Nano, but it's, it's... Yeah, if you don't need a third input, you don't need a second encoding channel, and you don't need mixing and, and switching live on the fly, then Nano's, Nano's the one and, and awesome. You know, you get to save a bunch of money and buy a Nano. But if you need those things in your production, then Mini is the absolute sweet spot. You get more advanced, more flexible audio inputs because you can take mic level signals in with phantom power, all kinds of stuff. Get that third input, which can make a big difference for some people's productions. You get the mix, you get switching, and you could do it easier because of the large touchscreen on the front. So for some people, man, it's night and day. So it just depends on what you need. Yeah, there you go. Um, other Pearl news. Uh, so mm -hmm. we have a Pearl firmware update coming next week, which is very exciting. We do. Um, this is 4.14.2 and um, some new features coming. Uh, maybe you could tell yeah. us uh, a little bit about this. I see there's a multi-viewer and some CMS enhancements. Uh, tell us about it, George. Well, this is actually an excellent segue from what we were just talking about is that, you know, some of this maybe not matter as much on a Nano, but if you had a Mini or Pearl 2, one of the things our customers have been asking a lot about for a long time is, I really need to see a multi-view heads up of my inputs without burning an encoding channel, which is kind of how the workaround has been. Well, with this update, you won't have to do that anymore. You now have the option of using the HDMI outputs in a multi-viewer format. We're just going to give you a quad split, basically, um, like this, like the screenshot shows here, uh, of, of inputs. So yeah, it's going to nice. make the people who are doing production you know, with, with Pearl boxes in front of their face, it's going to make it way easier. Uh, and it's, I think it's, um, this is something, especially our live event customers, I think they're actually going to love this. They've been begging for it. So I can't wait to see how people leverage it and, yeah. and improve their productions. As I can a see uh, teachers in classrooms as well. Um, yeah. You know, higher ed, ed, ed educators, people who need to be able to see that the camera is working to get that confidence. Maybe yeah. see what slides you're sharing off your laptop and, and know that, you know, the laptop is being recorded properly. Uh, things yeah, like exactly. That. It's, it's just easier confidence monitoring is, is a big thing. Yeah. Uh, but speaking of education, uh, the other one that, you know, not everyone is necessarily going to care about this, but we've added some improvements to extend some of the capabilities with Panopto and Kaltura integrations on Pearls. So if you are a Pearl customer who uses um, Panopto and Kaltura, this is going to add some extra things like pausing and resuming Panopto events, um, some some better template support, um, those sorts of things. So there's, you know, we're always looking at more enhancements with these two platforms. So this is another step in, in that. And we'll have more things coming in the future as well. But again, these are features that we're hearing from customers in the field that they need. Um, and so we're making it easier um, and easier to, to do. Awesome. Uh, we do have another comment that just came in from Kim Sorensen. Uh, Kim just says, Pearl in the cloud. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, before we get to that, though, maybe I don't know Kim, what you're talking about, Kim. <laughs> uh, Kim, maybe you could just tell us what, why that interests you or what you're looking for with Pearl in the cloud. Let us know in chat. Uh, we'll come back to that in just a moment. But And, and if you, Kim, if you don't want to say it publicly, send us an email. Uh, we'd love to engage with you in that conversation. Absolutely. Um, uh, while we're waiting to see if Kim has more context here, uh, I just wanted to highlight. Well, I'll, or do you want yeah, to jump I'll, in right I'll, now? Well, no, I was just going to um, run through a couple of more things in that update while we're waiting to. Okay, okay. Um, we'll go we, back to we made some enhancements to our TSP inputs uh, can be uh, chosen with TCP transport uh, option now. So minor enhancements for some people. Um, Improve some keyboard shortcuts when using local console mode. So for those who don't know, you can use the HDMI outputs to display a local console of the admin interface, and you can use a keyboard to do all kinds of shortcuts. That has some improved shortcuts. And we will be updating NDI version on Perl 2 uh, to NDI version 4.6.2. Um, so that I, I, I'm sure a lot of people 
Uh, <laughs> a lot of people out there have, have heard that NDI 5 was announced yesterday. That's not actually publicly available yet, but obviously we have our eye on it. But we were adding the previous most recent version of NDI um, into this update. Um, and I just see uh, the, the comment there. Is this update for Pearl Mini and Pearl 2? Yes, absolutely. It'll be for, for all Pearl models. Fantastic. Um, yeah, NDI seems like it's maybe a little fragmented. Maybe we need to do a whole show on just uh, yeah. fragmentation of NDI. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll come back to that. Um, yeah, I wanted to highlight also some new content, of course, if you're following yeah. us on this channel. Um, we've had a lot of uh, weekly VODs coming out, different topics. Uh, one of the mm -hmm. last ones we did was... Uh, Kind of going back to one of the bread and butter topics for us, capture card versus hardware encoder. When do you choose one over the other? So, um, you know, it may seem a little rudimentary to some of our viewers for sure, but um, there's some good information there for people who are, uh, you know, maybe getting started with building their setups or, you know, doing some yeah. uh, some different types of production workflows. So, um, yeah, check that video out. Uh, give it a like. I will do that right now. Um, it, yeah, it's something which, you know, talking to customers every day uh, in, in support, uh, we get calls all the time with people asking about our gear that, that still, you know, although we talk about it obviously all the time and most of our existing customers understand it, there's still a ton of people out there that don't necessarily understand the choices between something like a capture card versus a hardware encoder. Um, so we put together this video, uh, which I think is a, is a, you know, share it around. If you have people, if you're not sure yourself, then watch it and like it. If you know people that are still trying to figure it out and decide for themselves, which is best suited to them, uh, share that video with them. Um, there's a, there's a ton of information in there. Oh, look, who's that guy? <laughs> um, so yeah, check that out. I think it's, uh, I think it's a very helpful video. Yeah, great. We also have some more videos coming soon. We've got a, a quick start video for Pearl. I yeah. think that's a lot of people will find that useful if you have to like train your customers to set up their Pearl and, and things like that. That's going to be huge. Um, and then we also have a couple Epifan webinars. Um, well, recent ones, you could go to our website and check out our cloud, uh, Epifan cloud webinar from last week. Um, but mm -hmm. we also have an, an, an Epif oh, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we also have a Pearl Nano webinar coming next Wednesday. Um, yes. So you can register for that. Um, and I believe we'll throw some links into... Yeah, we'll um, throw some links into in chat. chat. Um, I actually have a very busy webinar uh, schedule next week, which is exciting. It also sounds exhausting. Um, but we have uh, on uh, the 8th, on Tuesday, uh, I will be joining our friends at PTZ Optics and one of our American distributors, JBNA, uh, for an education-focused webinar. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that one, talking about using PTZ Optics cameras and pearls in an education setting. Um, so that one's going to be awesome. We'll make sure to share those links in the chat. Yeah, That'll the link be is in the, the description of the video. And, uh, Excellent. Uh, and I have, have it up. Here's the page um, if we want to yeah. show the screen share. Um, so so register be a good for one. that one. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to that. Then, as you mentioned, Dan, we have our own Pearl Nano one on Wednesday on the 9th. And then on Thursday, I'm joining one of our European partners um, for a webinar that they're hosting as well. Um, that's that's really very narrowly targeted to um, you know certain European region-based live event companies. Um, so that one's not really targeted for the the, the public. Um, but, but the point uh, is that you're Mr. Webinar now, right? <laughs> yeah, the point is Every day of the I'm going to be doing a lot of talking, um, and we'll see if. Uh, We'll see if I fall down. <laughs> well, let's make sure you don't fall down right now, George, and wrap this show up. Um, it was great hanging out with you again on Live at Epifan. We <laughs> had some interesting topics today, I'm sure. And thanks to everyone who joined us. Um, anything yeah. else? Well, other than the usual, uh, make sure to like, follow, and subscribe. If you have suggestions uh, on topics you would like us to cover on this show, send it to us. We want to hear about it. Um, we're always looking for ideas and things to tackle um so please let us know you can send us an email uh and we'd be uh, happy to hear from you um i see kim's follow up here so you are working on a pearl in the cloud um <laughs> so 
Nobody said that, Kim. But uh, <laughs> if you but want, you should send us an again, email. Uh, for sure. You should definitely send us an email, Kim. We would love to engage in that conversation with you. Just info at epifan.com. Uh, drop us a line. And uh, Dan and I would love to engage with you on that and uh, and chat, figure out what, what you're looking for. What, you know, how can we help? Um, yeah. Uh, next episode will be June 17th. Um, yeah. That's right. I don't we'll know if we see. have... Uh, our content lined up for that one yet but uh no yeah, i'll be here. honest you yeah i mean dan i know you and i've talked about oh we're going to do all these cool things summer's coming it's hot outside it's great want to do things outside but we're still kind of in lockdown so that's kind of hurt the plans a bit so but by the 17th in theory we could even do this show from a patio maybe Ooh, i think we should when that's possible absolutely <laughs> exactly so looking forward to that um and then uh, like i said always do the like follow subscribe if you think someone's interested in this video share it with them and of course share our channel with them for all of the other information we talked about like those videos on software versus hardware versus capture cards versus encoders and all those fun things we do thanks everyone for joining us we will see you next time get registered for the webinars Bye bye <laughs> See you later.